Thank you. We now move to topical questions. Question one, Richard Simpson. Can I thank you, Presiding Officer, for reversing the order? That was very extremely helpful. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that children and young people have access to mental health services in the light of the reports that over 16,000 rejected referrals in the last three years. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We are committed to ensuring that children and young people of any age get access to high quality mental health services. All children referred to specialist child and adolescent mental health services will be assessed on an individual basis and where a request is not deemed suitable for intervention, we would expect clinicians to refer to the child to an appropriate service. Children accessing mental health services will have their needs assessed by a multiple uh, discipline team, which may include psychiatrists, psychologists, occupational therapists and specialist nursing staff. We are seeing a rise in demand. The past year has seen a 30 per cent increase in people being seen in child and adolescent mental health services. And in response, we are investing an additional £100 million for mental health over the next five years. This funding we invested in improving mental health services and will partly be used to further improve child and adolescent mental health services and bring down waiting times. Richard Simpson. Um, can I say to the Minister, I fully accept that this is a very challenging area and I welcome the Government introducing the 26-week target and now the 18-week target. But the three uh, health boards in my constituency, Fife, Forth Valley and Tayside, are all still failing to meet the 26-week target. And, and the, the number of... Uh, people not being seen over 18 weeks in Tayside has actually risen from July 2014 at 46% to July 2015 at 65% are now not being seen over 18 weeks. So I wonder if you'd like to tell me what, they're doing, what, what he's doing about ensuring that Scotland catches up with England in the proportion of funding. Scotland spends 0.4% of its budget England spends 0.7% of its budget, and the Scottish Children's Coalition has said that this is wholly inadequate. Minister? Well, I uh, recognise the uh, need uh, for continued uh, investment in uh, mental health services and CAMS uh, in particular. Uh, we have, of course, made available to NHS boards £16.9 million since 2009 to increase the number of psychologists working in specialist CAMS. We have committed another £3.5 million uh, this year as a result of this investment. We've seen a 70% growth in child psychology posts between October 2009 and December 2014. We uh, continue to invest £2 million per year in Tier 3 and Tier 4, uh, 4 uh, intensive community uh, CAMS uh, services. This investment is allowing NHS boards to grow the intensive outreach services. I recognise, having set that target, we want to reach that target. I'm in constant contact with the boards that aren't, aren't meeting that target. We continue to work with them, do what we can, but we must place it in some context and must recognise the increased demand. We must also recognise the fact that more children and young people are being seen through that service, but we will continue to do what we can to deliver for children and young people. And that's why, for example, we've invested the £100 million over the next five years that I've already mentioned, Presiding Officer. Dr. Simpson. Can I say that I welcome the general increase in child and adolescent mental health service staff? That's extremely welcome. But there has not been one additional child psychiatrist appointed since 2008. And this means that the, one of the leading groups in that multidisciplinary team is not, in fact, being increased with a child population increasing at the same time. My big concern at the moment is about these rejections. These referrals are made by health professionals of various sorts, plus educational psychologists. And yet in Tayside last year, there were 953 of these referrals rejected. 650 in five over three years. Fourth Valley, 164 over the last year. And really what I'm concerned about, and I would ask the minister to look into, is what are the outcomes for these individuals whom health professionals have regarded as appropriate for referral and yet are being rejected. It either means the protocols are not working or that there's something is happening in terms of the capacity of the service. But in either case, what's important surely are the outcomes for these children. Will he investigate that now? Minister. Well, I would, of course, reiterate the point I made in my uh, initial uh, answer to Dr Simpson, where a request is not deemed suitable uh, for intervention. It will be the case that uh, many are made and it is deemed uh, upon further assessment that they are not suitable uh, for CAMS. We would expect clinicians to refer, refer the child to an appropriate service. I, I mentioned the uh, additional £100 million. Uh, some of that funding uh, will go to primary care, and I think there is a big role there, uh, for example, in helping those who may have uh, had a rejected referral uh, to CAMS so that we can do more in the community. Dr Simpson and this whole chamber can be assured of this government's determination to ensure that we do all we can to support uh, the children and adolescents who are going through that system. Question number two, Sandra White. 
Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Scottish Government's Refugee Task Force. Minister Hamza Yusuf. Later today, President Officer, I will chair the first meeting of the Refugee Operational Task Force to provide a coordinated response and Scottish response to the global refugee crisis. It will focus on the practical issues in the areas of housing, health services, language support, transport, social services and many other issues too, looking at ensuring a very positive and welcoming environment for refugees arriving in Scotland. We will also look to harness the public engagement that has been overwhelming in response to that refugee crisis. The task force will have refugees in its membership and will include representatives from local government, refugee organisations and many other stakeholders. The priority of that task force will be to ensure, or I should say the immediate priority will be to ensure suitable accommodation and support is available for those arriving, noting in particular that there will be specific needs for some of those, uh, including, for example, unaccompanied children. The task force meeting comes further to the Refugee Summit, chaired by the First Minister last Friday and attended by party leaders across this chamber, and further to my meeting with the Scottish Refugee Council yesterday. Sandra White. I thank the Minister for his very comprehensive response and I do thank you on behalf of the many people and groups in my constituents who attended uh, the meeting last Friday. They were full of praise for everyone who attended that meeting. Uh, the Minister mentioned about a coordinated approach and people arriving. Uh, can I ask the Minister if the offer of uh, 20,000 refugees from David Cameron over five years is adequate and if he is aware of a timescale uh, when the refugees will be coming and arriving in Scotland? Minister. Look, I think any uh, country that is willing to accept refugees uh, should, we should welcome that uh, move and I think it's an important uh, step. I spoke to the Minister for Immigration, James Brokenshire, from the UK Government uh, this morning and put on record that I thought it was an important first step. But I would say to the member, uh, to reassure her, I think that should not, the 20,000 should not be a cap, uh, should not be an upper limit, but should be the absolute bare minimum. Uh, that is done. In the same way, the 1,000 uh, refugees that Scotland is willing to take immediately should not be seen as a cap or an upper limit, but should, see, should be seen as what we are immediately prepared to do and to take. I would also say that 20,000 over five years, I would hope that the majority of those 20,000 are, are front-loaded, as many uh, refugee, uh, refugee organisations uh, have asked for, because the crisis is imminent. The crisis is now, and therefore it would be wise to take in as many refugees now uh, as the UK and indeed Scotland playing a part in that uh, can do. In terms of the first part of our question in regards to coordinated response, uh, we will look to, to ensure that uh, there is a central focal point at, uh, at the end of this task force meeting uh, whereby we can harness all that public engagement because I know there's many efforts going up and down that country, see how we can coordinate that uh, into one central focal point. But I'll be able to say more uh, after the task force is met later today. Ms. White. Thank, thank you, Minister. It would be helpful, I think, for everyone in the Chamber and out with if we could have an update on a timescale when people are arriving here in Scotland. Uh, the Minister mentioned about uh, an update on the task force and the coordination. Uh, obviously, are aware of the many groups that have been set up, and I know all of uh, the MSPs have received you know, representation. I just wondered, Minister, when you're looking at a coordinated approach, if you would look at either a one-stop shop, a website, or a, you know, a telephone number, because many people have contacted me who are desperate to help the refugees. Uh, they're talking about somewhere to store goods, uh, somewhere to, to even you know, transport these goods to Cali or otherwise as well. So I think it would be in the best interest of everyone if we could have some update on whether it is going to be a website or a telephone number where people can have this information as quickly as possible and therefore any goods that's donated to get to reach the refugees as it's intended. Minister? Yes, uh, I thank the member for her, her remarks. In terms of timescale, we will continue to push the UK government to, to go as quickly as possible, while understanding, of course, the complexities of what they're trying to do, particularly with the Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme. Uh, there's a number of criteria attached to that, uh, which the UK government, of course, quite rightly, uh, has to ensure uh, are met. But be in no doubt, we're working at a pace uh, and, 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 and trying to push that along as swiftly as possible. In regard to her latter point, uh, I will certainly look at the ideas, and that will be some of the ideas that she's mentioned in terms of website and other things. It will be discussed in the operational task force. It is on the agenda for the operational task force, and I'll be able to give her an update, and indeed, if the Parliament wishes an update uh, after that meeting. And I would echo, finally, what Sandra White said in regards to uh, people up and down this country showing an overwhelming amount of compassion and humanity to help their fellow human beings. From Scotland supports uh, refugees right the way through to Glasgow, 
uh, welcomes refugees and many other organisations. Uh, I commend them for the work they're doing uh, and for the efforts that they're showing to, as I say, the most vulnerable people in the world. Patricia Fergus. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome the actions described by the Minister in response to Ms White, and I also welcome the U-turn performed by the Prime Minister on this issue. But his decision to accept 20,000 people over five years from the Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme does nothing to help those who are in imminent danger and whose situation in Syria is so bad that they are trying to make their escape in overcrowded and inadequate boats. Local authorities like Glasgow are to be congratulated for volunteering to accommodate more of these very vulnerable people, but they will need government support to do so. The Vulnerable Persons Scheme, by definition, deals with the elderly, the disabled and those who have been the victims of torture and sexual violence, people with particular support needs. Is the Minister confident that the required funding will be available to allow the type of support that such vulnerable people will need will be in place when they begin to arrive in our towns and cities? Minister. Well, I thank the member for raising some very important points. Uh, on our very first issue, I would agree with her entirely uh, that our preference would have been for the UK Government to also take a number of refugees from the southern European coastline, Italy, Greece, and indeed, uh, of course, uh, many coming through Hungary uh, as well. And we will continue to urge the UK to do that. Uh, the European uh, continent, the European Union, has to look at providing uh, better legal uh, pa safe passages uh, for refugees to come into, into Europe, and that's something we'll be pushing very hard. On her second point, I think it's well made, and I join her in commending Glasgow City Council for showing a lead, uh, not just in this refugee crisis, but in fact to refugees for a number of years. Uh, yes, uh, the discussions around the task force, inevitably much of that will be around the financial uh, packages available, understanding that local authorities will be the ones who often will be providing the majority of those services. Uh, and so I'm confident that uh, the noises from the UK government are positive about financial packages. I don't have the detail yet. Uh, I did speak to the minister this morning, but we didn't get into that level of detail. Uh, but be assured that the Scottish government, the lo local government and uh, the UK government are working very, very closely to ensure that there's no gaps in service provision. And the First Minister herself made an announcement over the weekend that the Scottish Government uh, will put £1 million forward initially uh, in terms of seeing where we can, if, if we're needed to, to plug any uh, gaps in, in service provision. But I think the, uh, I'll have more to update the member on perhaps after the task force meets. Jim McGregor. Um, thank you. Um, will the task force work with local authorities in rural areas who may face greater challenges um, to help refugees due to peripherality and distance from major population centres? And what assessment has the task force made of Scotland's preparedness um, in terms of having adequate Arabic translators uh, to help um, support Syrian refugees who may be without English? Minister. Uh, again, I think the member raises uh, an important point. What's been overwhelming, and this is not just the public support, but also the number of local authorities who have said that they're prepared uh, to be involved in this. Again, after the task force, I'll be able to provide an update uh, from COSLA, who, who will be represented there, uh, on the number of local authorities that are expressed an in interest. Uh, but my understanding is that to, you know, over half of uh, the local authorities in Scotland have expressed some sort of interest in being involved in resettling refugees, and I imagine a number of them uh, have rural communities in them. Uh, so we will discuss that. That will be part of the discussion. There is a uh, more academic debate to have, to, to have over how widely you disperse uh, refugee populations, and that again will be part of the task force discussion. On his second point, I think it's a very valid one uh, to make. The reason why Glasgow are coming uh, in their own capacity as Glasgow City Council to the task force is because they have a huge amount of expertise and they have the infrastructure having, to, having taken refugees and indeed asylum seekers since uh, the year 1999. Uh, and therefore, their expertise will be vital in informing other local authorities and the infrastructure, including interpreters, that they have to have in place to ensure that refugees. Uh, when they're resettled, uh, are able to, to have all the services uh, and have access to services that they need. Question three, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what benefits it considers there will be for Midlothian and the borders from the Borders Railway. Cabinet Secretary Chris Brown. Uh, President Officer, we believe that the Borders Railway will assist in preventing a decline in the Midlothian and Borders populations, as well as acting as a catalyst for encouraging approximately £33 million at 2012 prices of benefits for the wider Scottish economy. It will increase business development and housing opportunities, inward investment, potentially public sector relocation, mm. all for the local community. 
It has now connected the people of Midlothian and the Scottish borders to the National Rail Network, and it will connect communities, encourage more affordable housing, reduce carbon emissions, and reduce reliance on the car. Christine Graham. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Can I say, Presiding Officer, I am thrilled after campaigning 16 years in here of the Borders Railway and a founder member of the Cross Party Group to be on that train tomorrow. I have got my hat selected. It is understated as you would expect it to be. But can I say to the Cabinet Secretary, there are still opportunities to increase tourist footfall. For example, at Tweed Bank, where the signage could be improved to direct travellers to Abbotsford, that has been raised with me, and indeed at Newton Grange to the Mining Museum. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to undertake or his colleague, the Minister for Tourism, to see the very most is made of that journey for tourists and the stops en route. Minister Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say, President Officer, I always expect understatement from the member. Um, but I should say that it's worth pointing out that um, Christine Graham, uh, yourself, Presiding Officer, people like uh, Madge Elliott, who's campaigned for this for 50 years, people like uh, Petra Bieberbach, have all played an integral part in uh, the success. It's interesting that success often has many fathers. In this case, there's quite a few mothers that deserve to be uh, paid tribute to as part of the success of this line. In relation to tourism, uh, I can advise that we have taken quite a number of measures to make sure we do properly exploit the benefits. There's a marketing campaign which will promote the Borders Railway, both nationally and internationally, and that's intended to boost tourism, investment and associated regeneration in the areas along the entire length of route. There are a number of other uh, trans uh, sorry, tourist initiatives which we're taking in relation to this because we want to properly exploit that. Uh, we are um, willing to consider any further suggestions. In the words of the Minister that spoke at Time for Reflection, I think the adamant word was EFEFA, be open. We are certainly open to any suggestions, and that includes to the member or indeed any member that wants to put any proposals which will help us fully exploit the benefits of this line. Christine Gill. Uh, can I also say, Presiding Officer, it's remiss of me not to mention the Petitions Committee, which really stimulated this, and they've taken a bit of a kicking recently, and they don't deserve it because they were the way pathway into the railway. But can I say to the Minister, who is wanting to know about other things, there are teething issues, for example, at the Gallows Shields Transport Interchange, where the electronic information boards have got teeny, teeny weeny print, and indeed the automatic ticket dispensers at Newton Grange need recalibrated, so you, because you've got to have very swift reflexes to work the thing. So can you make, I mean, these all make the journey smooth and make people enjoy it. They're minor, but we could cure them quite easily. So can I ask him to get in touch again with the relevant authorities, make them aware of these, and if I've got any more little issues, I'll raise them with them another time. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, I'm grateful to the member for feedback, and I should just say that ScotRail staff are aware of the issue in relation to the automatic ticket dispensers. I think there's a huge amount of uh, new plant as well as the line itself, and there will inevitably be some uh, snagging issues, but those are being dealt with, and I think we all hope for the best of possible days tomorrow, which will be a fantastic day for the borders. I can confirm to the Chamber in the various events I've been involved in the last week or so, there is real excitement and pride in this new rail, uh, border, uh, border railway in Scotland. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's remarks about openness, which is certainly something to build on from the past in terms of the cross-party work on, on this issue. And I also welcome the thrilling sight of the passengers' full trains um, going down to, um, to Tweed Bank and back. And, and I recognise Scottish Government's work and those of other agencies and certainly the Campaign for Borders Rail. Would the Cabinet Secretary also acknowledge the contribution made by Scottish Labour in the development and vision of the process over the years? And now that we have together secured steam trains and some cycle space on, uh, for tourism, will he commit... Uh, I'm chancing my arm here, um, Cabinet Secretary. Will he, will he comment on the, the future of rail freight for the borders and for Scotland, and possibly even on the extension of the line to Carlisle? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, uh, as with everyone else that uh, contributed, uh, and I know that the member herself made representations along with others like Christine Graham on the issue of tourist trains, which we were able to uh, accommodate. Uh, so I do recognise the efforts of her and her colleagues as well. In relation to possible extension, what we said is we really do have to see how this line works. We are very confident in its success, but we have to see uh, how that works. And we've gone beyond that and said that if the local council, as they've said, or the local transport partnership are looking to do a feasibility study for potential future extension, Extension, then we will help out with that. And by that I mean I'll make sure that Transport Scotland and agencies of government provide any support necessary to carrying out that feasibility study. 
One of the points made in relation to that by a, another campaigner was that uh, that should also take into account the potential for freight, um, because it may not be the case that you can get a case sufficiently strong with just passenger numbers. So, of course, that will be in the hands of those taking forward the feasibility study. But I would uh, say to the member, we're more than happy, as I've said, and committed to the idea that Transport Scotland will help out in that process. Jim Hume. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And uh, I too look forward to uh, the train journey tomorrow, albeit I'll probably not be wearing such a fancy hat as Christine Graham. I'll maybe borrow it. Thank you, Christine. Uh, the former First Minister actually said that the Borders Rail link would serve as a catalyst for the restoration of the historic route right through to Carlisle. So it'd be interesting to hear from the Cabinet Secretary uh, today uh, at what stage his government, government would see appropriate to step in to look at a timetable for a feasibility study uh, and, uh, and see what e economic benefits would be uh, underlined by not just the former First Minister, but also the leaders of both the Scottish Borders Council and even Carlisle City Council. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the member's question does prompt me to say that we also owe some thanks to the very cooperative relationship we've had with the councils, especially the Borders Council, in relation not just to the line, but to the events which have led up to uh, tomorrow, uh, where the Queen will formally open uh, the new line. So uh, I would recognise the effort that they made, a very good relationship in particular with David Parker at Borders Council. Uh, in relation to the extension, possible extension, I, I really just, I think, laid out the position of the Scottish Government. The Council and the uh, Transport Partnership may well come forward with a proposal for a feasibility study. They said they're interested in doing that. And what I have said, building on the comments of the former First Minister, is that we will provide every assistance with that. And also the point, just to repeat, made to Claudia Beamish, that as well as looking at possible uh, passenger numbers, which is a challenge because of the nature of the terrain that it goes through, uh, that should also look, in my view, and as suggested by others, at freight. Uh, but the important thing is that we get this off to a good start. We are using tomorrow a very old steam engine, the Union of South Africa. So all our efforts just now are on making sure that makes the journey, um, given some of the passengers it will be carrying. I think it's very important, including um, my boss. Um, so I think we have to make sure that does it. And we also have to concentrate on making sure this is a success. The bread and butter of this line is the fact that services start to, uh, from Edinburgh or Tweed Bank and get to the other side efficiently and reliably. And we've got to concentrate on doing that and maximising the use of this particular line, first of all. Thank you. We now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 14156. In the name of John Swinney on progress in the Scottish economy, members who wish to take part in the debate.